Hello, fellow foodies. This is Dr. Cassandra Quave, and I am really excited to bring today's show to you. We're going to be talking about a fascinating um, botanical family. You may know it as the nightshade family, but Within the realm of botany, we call it the Solanaceae family, and we have the perfect expert to tell us a bit more about the Solanaceae. Dr. Sandra Knapp is a specialist on the taxonomy of this family, and she's spent much time in the field in Central and South America collecting plants that belong to this group. Her main focus of research is the taxonomy of the genus Solanum, and just as a point of information, this is a genus that contains potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplants, and is just one of only a handful of flowering plant genera with more than 1,000 species. Um, Dr. Knapp came to the Natural History Museum in 1992, and she has described more than 75 new species of plants. She's the author of several popular books on the history of science and botanical exploration, including the award-winning win Potted Histories that was published in 2004. She's also authored more than 175 peer-reviewed scientific papers and is actively involved in promoting the role of taxonomy worldwide. Um, in 2009, she was also honored by the Peter Raven Outreach Award from the American Society of Plant Taxonomists and the UK National Biodiversity Network's John Burnett Medal. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Sandy. It's great to see you. Well, it's great to see you too, Cassandra. Very nice to meet you. I yeah. should plug my new book, which is called um, Extraordinary Orchids, which is actually published by Chicago University Press. I don't know anything about orchids, but it's a fun book. It has lots of really good pictures. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, besides the orchids, I think today we're going to focus on solanaceous plants. And I know you know that we should. They're my favorite. <laughs> That's great. And you've dedicated your career to this. So why don't we start with just this general concept of how can you have a plant family where you have, you know, a rich number of, of species in this in this family that are toxic. And then there are others that are edible and, in fact, are some of our most important edible plants. Well, you know, toxicity is, int I mean, all plant families have have some some taxa which are not good for us and other taxa which we use but actually the ones that are not good for us we do use as well because all medicines are essentially toxins at sublethal doses and so many of the members of solanaceae that we think of now as being as being um poisonous well they are poisonous yes. things like henbane and mandrake and and deadly nightshade they're actually very important and have been and continue to be actually very important drugs in medicine, atropine, which used to be used in the ophthalmologist's office to dilate your pupils mm -hmm. so they could look in and check the health of your eyes. That's what atropine used to be, you know, atropine derived from deadly nightshade used to be used for that. Something else is used now because um, atropine leaves your pupils dilated for too long and it makes it really hard to see. <laughs> but um, so they're important. They're important medicines. They're in medicine. They're important in surgery and all, you know, all kinds of things. So, so the fact that there's these two different sides of the Solanaceae, it's a bit more extreme in the nightshade family. It's a, it's a bit more extreme. It's, um, it's down to chemistry. It's all down to chemistry. I mean, most things are most, well, all poisons are down to chemistry, but, but part, part of the Solanaceae family has these, this particular kind of alkaloid, which is a five membered ring with an, it's like a little house with a nitrogen on one of the corners. So it has an mm -hmm. N on one of the corners. Um, those are called tropane alkaloids. And one of the ones that probably everybody listening has heard of is nicotine. So uh -huh. tobacco is another member of the Solanaceae. And that's mm -hmm. probably, um, aside from ethanol, probably the most widely used drug by human beings is nicotine. And it's a drug. And it's yeah. the same kind of drug as atropine and hyoscyamine and scopolamine and all those other things mm -hmm. come from those toxic Solanaceae. Now, the other part of the Solanaceae um, where we have potatoes and tomatoes and, and aubergines or eggplants and whole bunches of uh, pe chili peppers, all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff, is um, they don't have tropane alkaloids. So it's just down to chemistry. That's we, also use, we also use solanaceae for horticulture as well. So I think that's why, because you think of our, you know, the common garden, garden bedding plant, the petunia, mm. that's a solanaceae too. So... So I think that's why I, in a way, why I was so attracted to it and have stuck with it for such a long time. It and I had, well, because there, there's so much more to find out, but, but it's just because they're used by people in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And that makes them endlessly fascinating because you can explore 
the, the relationship between plants and people in all kinds of dimensions That's in great. this one plant family, which isn't a particularly big one either. Well, your, your discussion of poisons and this kind of line between poison and medicine is, is really fascinating, I think, especially to this audience. Um, when the, the different compounds that you, that you named, I'm thinking of like scopolamine, hyosamine, um, these are used in medicine. Um, I think one of them is actually used to treat motion sickness. Atropine mm -hmm. is used in medicine still, not ophthalmologically, but um, as poison antidotes um, for different types of poisoning. Um, so it, it is interesting how, how these very toxic compounds made their way into medicine. And could you tell us a bit about why do these plants make compounds like nicotine? Is it to benefit the plant in some way? Well, I, you know, there's, the, the, you can tell lots of just so stories about why mm -hmm. plants make particular chemicals, but nicotine is definitely something which deters herbivores. Mm -hmm. So it deters some herbivores, but other herbivores like the tobacco hornworm, for example, just, kind of gobble it right up and do not care you know so so these chemicals have uses for plants and it's a it, i mean in a way the chemistry of the plant is a constant arms race with its with its herbivores because herbivores evolve tolerance and plants evolve different responses mm -hmm. and and plants have all kinds of ways of responding to things professor ian baldwin who is the director of the um, max planck institute for chemical ecology in in germany has a fantastic set of experiments, which he's been doing for many years in the deserts of Utah um, on a tobacco species, looking at the complex chemistry and behavior of these plants vis-a-vis -vis their, their various different herbivores and pollinators. And he's got, I mean, he's done some really elegant work showing plants behave. I mean, they behave in response to what's being done to them by caterpillars chomping into them or hummingbirds coming to visit the flowers or the, all kinds of things. They're extraordinary. It's fantastic. And that's all been done with a wild native U.S. species of tobacco. Oh, cool. Well, and speaking of species, I think it's, it's, it's amazing that you've described 75 new species of plants. What is that process like? Um, how, do you, how do you even start with finding a new species and then go through the steps of, of, of describing it? Well, I think, a lot, I mean, I, it's lots more than 75 now, I think. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I, I think, you know, it's funny. And, and it starts with knowing your group really well. Mm -hmm. And so you so you studied it a lot in the herbarium, and so you recognize something that you haven't seen before. And actually, many of the new species that I found, I found in the herbarium, mm -hmm. not in the field, because someone else has collected it before, and nobody's put a name to it, and it ends up coming to me. And then I think, hmm, this is a bit different to something I've seen before. I mean, we 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 had right before the Europe went into lockdown last year, um, about a month, a year and a month ago. That seems mm -hmm. like such a long time ago. But right before that happened, I just had come back from a from a five week trip to Argentina in which we'd mm -hmm. specifically gone looking in the field for something which we had recognized in the herbarium that we knew was completely what well, we suspected was completely different. And in fact, it was. So we described it. So that's our lock. That's one of our lockdown, one of our three lockdown species. That's so great. I think the thing is. I did a lot of, when I was a graduate student at Cornell, I did a lot of collecting. I collected for the Missouri Botanical Garden as a, as a plant collector. You know, they, mm -hmm. I went to Panama and I just collected everything. And there you collect loads and loads of stuff. You have no idea what it is because you don't know those groups of plants. But then they go back to the specialists. So it's like a kind of, it's like a distribution system. If somebody's out there collecting um, and, and then things go back to specialists and specialists recognize them as new because of their knowledge of the group. So it depends. It's like knowing the streets in your town. It's like knowing where to go in your town. You know, if you're dropped in the middle of no, somewhere where you don't really know where, where to go, it's really hard to find the chemist or to find the bank. Whereas in your hometown, you know exactly where to go because you know it. It's familiarity. So it's the same kind of thing. And you come across something that, you, that you've never seen before or looks different. And sometimes, you know, after looking at it carefully and comparing it to other things and checking, and there's lots of checking and going back and forth. And that's why actually most, many new species, the early were collected 75, 70 to 75 years before they're described. So they kind of sit there in collections until a specialist comes mm -hmm. along and looks at them, which is why we need more specialists. We Absolutely. <laughs> 
<laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I think this this um, particular family is so economically important, and I wanted to talk a bit more about crops and crop wild relatives. Um, what can you share with us about about this topic within the Solanaceae? Maybe we start with Solanum. Well, so Solanum is really interesting because Solanum has three of has has one of the big four. So one of the big four, um, you know, calorie crops that humans eat. So that's rice, wheat, maize, and the lowly potato. And potatoes are much better than all those grasses anyway. They've got more vitamin C and vitamin A and all kinds of stuff. But um, potatoes were first domesticated in the Andes. And potatoes are interesting because they're what's called tetraploids. So they have two, two gene sets which have come together to make something completely different. So using wild relatives in the breeding of potatoes has been, per, been particularly challenging because it's hard to get, to get um, cross-breeding of these, of these um, wild species, many of which are diploid, so they have the one set of chromosomes. And the whole thing about plant breeding is that what you do is you take your crop, which we've consistently narrowed its genetic base by selecting just the things we want, like yield or perfect roundness in a potato or size in a tomato or whatever. And, and so you're narrowing the genetic base all the time. And eventually what happens is something like the Irish potato famine, which is what happened in Ireland in 1845 when basically most of Ireland was cultivated with potatoes. And people were very poor, but they weren't hungry because you can, you can eat well on, I mean, it's not great nutritionally, but you can eat well on, on an acre of potatoes. And when the late blight came in, because potatoes are vegetatively propagated, they were genetically all the same. And the whole thing, and that changed the face of the United States completely. Without the Irish potato famine, the United States would not be what it is today. That's a really good point. And, you know, I'm concerned about a, kind of a relapse of this, of this sort of occurrence. I mean, if you look at fungal disease now in bananas and other cleanly propagated crops, mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on that? And how do we better prepare and secure our food systems um, to avoid future famine? Well, I think it, it is quite important for us to think about um, to think about wild relatives as sources of, of genes of interest. They're also, with traditional breeding methods, though, they're also sources of genes which are things that we don't want. So they might be things we do want, like resistance to pests, but they're also sources of things we don't want, like toxicity or bad taste or whatever, you know, stunted growth, you know, whatever. And so with traditional breeding, all those things got carried along. But with, with new molecular breeding techniques like, like CRISPR-Cas9 and all these new ways of taking genes out and inserting them directly in, we can actually use wild relatives in a much more targeted way and kind of keep up with the evolutionary arms race because it is never going to end. And we will never have a point at which we don't need, uh, we will never have a point that we don't need biodiversity. Biodiversity is the most essential thing we have on the face of the earth. It's more important than anything else because it's what gives us the resilience that we need to have a to have a functioning planet, which includes food for people. So, so crossing um, can take a long time. So traditional plant breeding can take a long time. Doing using molecular techniques can be can make it much faster. But then it's also kind of you know it's not black and white. You know. Um, you know, in Europe, we have there's a huge movement against genetically modified crops, which which is essentially um, what I'm calling ed genetically edited crops. But, you know, all crops are genetically modified. Every single bit of food we eat is genetically modified because somebody has been breeding it for something that we want and changing its genetic makeup in 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 a symbiotic relationship with us. So it's something we have to think about quite carefully. But I think we also have to think about how do we how do we preserve diversity? And you could just preserve diversity in gene banks and you could have one of everything, right? Got one of everything and that means you've got all the crop wild relatives. But each crop wild relative species is genetically in itself quite diverse. So actually conserving them in their habitats is a much more re reasonable way to go about thinking about using crop wild relatives for food security in the future. And I mean, in a way, they have a perfect right to be here as well. They don't have to be useful to us. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> well, and I, I'm thinking about even diversity, diversity within a species. So if you if you consider tomatoes and all the different shapes and sizes and flavors that they bring to bear, um, and that, as you as you mentioned, is is the result of of human selection and uh, over time. Um, how is there any idea over how many varieties we have of these major crops? Or, I don't. It, it, it they vary, and what what's super interesting about about within and you're right, the within species. I was talking about the crop wild relatives, but actually within the cultivated crop, there's a huge amount of land race, what we call land race diversity as well. So with tomatoes, it's often with fruit fruit size, shape, and color, right? And potatoes, there it's it's often with um. You know, you get can get waxy potatoes or flowery potatoes, and and in China, for example, there are two thousand named varieties of eggplants. So they have names. Wow. They are considered to be different, and every country has has you know we all have slightly different tastes in foods. Mm -hmm. Actually, there are some some colleagues of mine as part of a big project that we were involved in called EU Soul did um, some really interesting taste testing, and they showed that in various parts of the world, people actually prefer the same kinds of tomatoes, but they're called different things in those different countries. So so actually figuring out what's the same and what's different within these land races, but also preserving land races, which are very well adapted to particular places where they grow. A colleague of mine, Iris Peralta in Argentina, is working with farmers looking at um, Argentinian varieties of tomatoes, and, and potatoes as well, but but tomatoes mostly, um, looking at at you know preserving some of those and the, and the heritage kinds of of tomatoes and and but they're often more slightly more disease prone as well, and don't give as high of yields and you know all that kind of stuff. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a balancing act. But often if you think about resilience against say food system shock, having things that were well adapted, but maybe didn't give quite as much might be a good idea. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's really, that's really a key point. Um, and, and thinking about local crops and what's important to local farmers and in, in one country is going to differ greatly from another country. And I'm wondering, um, beyond land races, are there other species that are found within this family that perhaps are eaten in some countries, but aren't as broadly spread as like tomatoes or potatoes or no absolutely and, and and one of those well, well there actually there's lots of them there's about 25 different cr different crops within solan solanum itself not not solanaceae but just solanum um which are which are eaten locally so there are things like one of the ones that's kind of gone slightly global but not in the same way as the kiwi fruit did is the is the tamarillo which is called solanum batasium it's got a, it's kind of kind of got a teardrop shaped fruit, which is sort of um, purplish, and you cut it open, and it's kind of orange on the inside, and you, it's used to make juices and stuff. We have them all the time here in the supermarkets, and in, they're growing them in New Zealand and trying to market them in the same way that the kiwi fruit kind of made a, but you know the kiwi fruit was like a, a, a sensation, you know it looked just like a little kiwi, it was perfect. But um, and then there's ones, there's several that are that are eaten down the Andes. There's one called the pepino, which is called Selena muricatum, which is pepino in Spanish means cucumber. So it's so it's like a cucumber. It's 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 round and oval and about the size of a melon. It looks like a melon. They're often called cucumber melons, and it's got purple stripes on the outside. And you it can cut it up and eat it in salads, or you can just eat it raw. But that's made it over to Asia, and it's very popular in China now. The pepino. So that's starting to be cultivated more, you know. So, so there's all these little local crops which are which are really interesting and useful. And in Africa, for example, there, I mean, there are so eggplants are interesting because we think there's one kind of eggplant, right? The the purple one, right? Ton in China, there's tons of varieties of eggplants. They come in all shapes and all sizes, and they come in green ones and purple ones and white ones and long skinny ones with stripes and big fat ones with you know all these different shapes. In Africa, there are two other species of eggplants, which are not actually closely related to the domesticated or what I call the, the brinjal eggplant, the, the sort of eggplant that we know. And one of these is a scarlet eggplant. And another one is called the goma eggplant. The scarlet eggplant is also called gilo. And it was taken by enslaved peoples to Brazil and has become a, a, 
a major foodstuff in Brazil. Um, but that one in Africa, it's used not just for its fruits, which are stewed like tomatoes. You put them in stews like tomatoes, but um, but also for its leaves. So its leaves are, are cooked like a spinach or eaten or stir fried. And also, um, so are a bunch of other solanum crops in Africa used as, as what we call pot herbs and in Mexico, interestingly, but not in South America. That's really interesting. Um, I've always thought of selenium leaves as being quite toxic, um, no. but, but no. Well, it, depends. it probably depends on which ones, which ones you get. Yes, I guess but the, that's but right. The, but the common sort of field um, nightshade in, in the U.S., for example, mm -hmm. uh, a species very similar to that, and actually probably that species, depending on where you are in the U.S., is actually eaten in China as in stir fries. It's quite oh, good, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, and in Mexico, a lot of those species are eaten. They're called queletes, mm -hmm. and they're and they're eaten as as pot herbs. They're part of you know amaranthus leaves are eaten as a quelete, and and the same the same is true for these selenium leaves. Not as common as the amaranthus queletes, but but they're still they're still there. And what I find interesting is it's very very common in Africa, very common in Central America, but not in South America. Hmm. But in, and in and in Asia as well. Interesting. So I don't know what that's due to. I had a student once who was doing a doing a sort of um, looking at the at the Bantu migrations in Africa and the common names of, of all of these different. Um, one of them is called Selenum scabrum. Mm -hmm. uh, changes through Africa, and you could follow them through the Bantu migrations, going going from west to east in Africa. It was fascinating. Wow. You know, there's lots of lots of common names and. And a lot of the herbarium material that we get to study when we look at these as taxonomists, it says things like weed in field. And I think, and I think actually what it was is that was something somebody was actually cultivating. <laughs> it's just it wasn't recognized as a crop by the, by the yeah. Victorian taxonomist who was stomping around in his pith helmet, you know, collecting plants. <laughs> It was, um, but that was somebody's very precious plant, and they collected it tragically. Oh no, that was my dinner. No, <laughs> that's right. I don't think so. They were well, it could have been. You know, the leaves and the leaves are really, really high in vitamins, and so there's a there's a big move uh, afoot in both Kenya and Uganda are looking at these um, black nightshades, which are related to a thing called Selenum nigrum, which is common in Europe and in China, um, and but what's all called Selenum nigrum in the U.S. is a bunch of other species, but but that that kind of thing, little, little, little crummy little herbs with little white flowers and usually black fruits. And those um, are very, very high in, in important vitamins. And mm -hmm. so they're looking at trying to include those more in people's diets because they're easy to grow, they're locally adapted, and they're important nutritionally. We often think of food, you know, we often think of food, and, and I do it too, to a certain extent, is you think of food as being about calories. But actually, food is about vitamins and minerals as much as it is about calories. Because if you tried to just eat calories, you would die. You couldn't. You couldn't live. So the so the whole focus on vegetables and and greens and things is a is a really important thing. I think, really, in the in the kind of plant breeding industry as well, is to start to think about vegetables a lot more and about and about nutrition in the round as opposed to just big calorie crops. That's great. Yeah, I think I think this idea of when we go to the to the supermarket and see, you know, just our standard our standard crops, most people probably don't even imagine that there are all these other possibilities of foods out there in the world. And I'm wondering from all of your travels and experiences and also in consuming some of these um, are there any in particular that you think would be really well suited to to global production, um, or as as possible crops to take take out of just local production and bring it to a larger scale? You know, that's kind of a double edged sword in a way, because mm -hmm. once you take something out of like like happened kind of with quinoa, which was if you take yes. it out of local production and bring it into global production, sometimes that can have serious repercussions on local people. Mm -hmm. But I think the scarlet eggplant actually is something that could w could be much more widely used because it's very good, very very good nutritionally, and it's a kind of thing that you put in stews like tomatoes. You put it in instead of tomatoes, for example. We have an exhibit just now at the Natural History Museum, which is called Our Broken Planet, which is also which which has a whole section in it about foods, plant breeding, 
crop wild relatives and and there's a, se- a whole series of kind of um podcasts and interviews and sort of things that are going on with it as well and it's sort of so it's something we've been thinking about quite a lot about you know what 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 do we do to kind of to make sure the planet doesn't break anymore yeah you know it, and i think you're absolutely right about ensuring that you're not causing damage to local people that rely on these crops as they're a major source of, of, of food. Um, at the same time, we have such vast areas of landmass that are being clear cut for, you know, palm oil and soy and corn. Um, it would be great. And a lot of that's due to, you know, government incentives and subsidization of some of these crops. I'd love to see more, more, um, subsidization of, uh, more subsidies towards, you know, other vegetables and these leafy greens and, and crops that bring more vitamins and nutrients to people and not just for animal feed. Yeah. I think, I think animal feed is a big problem because animal Mm -hmm. feed, you know, the, the animal feed, you know, a lot of that, I mean, we all eat plants the whole time. Even committed carnivores are actually eating plants, but they're processed plants. You know, Mm -hmm. they're, they're very expensive processed plants, but um, I I think I think there's a lot to be said for kind of um. Because once something gets out of sort of local production, I mean, and, and you know we can't. There are too many of us to live on subsistence agriculture. There are mm-hmm. just too many of us. Yeah. So we need we need big corporations. So so it's going to sound like what I'm going to say is against big corporations, but it's but it's really not. Is I think we need to have kind of. A, a real think about about the balance between between supporting local communities and doing things the most efficient cheapest way possible because i i read somewhere and i, I can't remember where i read this and you might know if this is true cassandra i don't know um that that the average person today spends a smaller percentage of their of their annual income on food than they ever have in history so mm. food is cheaper now than it yeah. ever has been and and that's wrong, actually, mm-hmm. because food costs to produce. Yeah. Yeah, and, and no, absolutely. And then you get into into you know issues with with adequate pay for the people that actually produce the food as well. Mm-hmm. So there are social justice issues at play there as well. Yeah. So I think I think you know in thinking about the future of food, we also af- actually have to bring in all of the kind of social science of, of social justice and think about think about communities and and think about you know who who benefits and you know really we sh- we all benefit because we all benefit from having good food but another colleague of mine who works uh, in, in Colorado called Colin Cowrie who works for the USDA has done a wonderful paper where where he looked at the homogenization of food i'm sure you you've seen this amazing study which is yeah. that we're all eating more different kinds of foods but all of us are eating more of the same kinds of different kinds of food. Mm-hmm. And, and that's kind of, and that's almost causing, that's accelerating the decline of these locally adapted crops because everybody's eating the same stuff. Yeah. Well, on this topic of, of local crops and um, food security, I wonder, could you tell us a bit about your thoughts on how, how conservation of species conservation of biodiversity, how can we tie that to food security? Do are, is it possible to support both of those concepts? Oh, I think it's eminently possible. I think it's eminently possible. What we need to know, I mean, there are lots of things that we don't. That's actually it's slightly shocking that we don't know. Mm-hmm. There are lots of things that we don't know that we should know. Like, what's the distribution of all the wild relatives of X? I mean, we know it pretty well now for a lot of the selenums because. We've been working on it for a while, and it's true in other in other in other groups as well. But you know, what's the genetic diversity? I know the I know the distribution. You know, I know where species X, which is a relative wild relative of the eggplant, I know where its distribution is, where it grows in Africa, for example. Mm-hmm. But I don't know what the genetic variation across that distribution is. Some of the edges are a bit drier than other edges. Mm-hmm. So it might be that those ones have genes which would be particularly useful in, fa- in the face of a changing climate, for example. And, you know, there's just a, there's a lot of basic, basic, what I would call natural history, because that's fallen very much out of fashion. Natural history is, is basically out of yeah. fashion. And that combined with the kind of, you know, molecular biology. But, but one problem is that we've kind of, 
we've made it so difficult for ourselves by making natural history out of fashion mm -hmm. and doing things in a really o almost overly commercial way that, that places where wild diversity still lives are suspicious. And rightly so. You know, yeah. for many, many years, people from the north basically plundered the south. Mm -hmm. And so it stands to reason that people are going, wait a minute, you know, wait a minute, this is, this is, this is genetic diversity that, that we need to keep for ourselves. Not for ourselves, but, you know, this is our patrimony, as it were. Yeah. So, yeah. I'd like to talk a bit about the challenges in the field of botany. Um, one of the things that I've noticed as curator of, a, of an herbarium is it's, it's, we seem like a, there are greater and greater challenges just with supporting herbaria with operational budgets with training new, the new generation of taxonomists. Where do you see the field going? We were talking about natural history. How, how does this all go hand in hand with our ability to document biodiversity? Um, well, I think, I think herbaria, and, and by extension, natural history collections more broadly, but let's, let's focus on herbaria, uh, are absolutely essential resources. And, and one of the things that we, as people who work in herbaria, if, you know, we've got to go out there and not just say, we need more money, we need more money, but show, say, look what we can do. Mm -hmm. and, and as we digitize, as we make all of these data more digitally available, it becomes more and more clear how important they are to, for studying, say, phenological change and changes in, in flowering and fruiting times or, or distributional change or, you know, all, all that other kind of stuff. And I think, I mean, you can almost look at it like each herbarium is the is a piece in a giant jigsaw puzzle, which is the diversity of plant life on Earth. And so we need all the jigsaw p puzzle pieces and continuing to kind of build them into a huge 3D kind of structure to really understand understand plant diversity. And I and and yeah, and herbaria can be sometimes be a hard sell, but digitization is making them more available. And, and making them more accessible. And once something's accessible, people's, people begin to understand its, its utility. I can remember going to Duke University, ooh, a long time ago now, it must have been about maybe seven years ago or eight years ago, it was a while ago. Mm -hmm. And the people in the herbarium at Duke had, um, had scanned at very high resolution some of the really beautiful images of the endemics of the area. And the president of the university had them on his wall. Oh, that's great. I thought was, boy, that's perfect. <laughs> our, director, our director has a scan of not an exceptionally beautiful specimen, but a specimen that Joseph Banks, well, that Robert Brown actually collected in Australia on the Flinders expedition mm -hmm. and then the accompanying drawing that goes with it. So I'm trying to, I, in, for my work in the herbarium, I'm trying to get the images of the herbarium out so people see what they are. That's great. As much as possible. I think digitization is our friend for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we've been working towards digitization of our collection. It's a much smaller collection than yours. We only have 23,000 specimens. So, we um, have like a half million, I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a bit scary. I mean, it's a bit scary because you think, okay, if we keep doing it at the rate we're doing it now, it'll take us 500 years to do this. <laughs> and um, we can't afford that long. So we, yeah. need to, we need to figure out new ways, new ways to do this. And I mean, and one of the reasons that we know that our planet is broken, like our exhibition says, is that we have the evidence. If we didn't have the evidence, which is held in herbaria, how would we know? Yeah. Except it doesn't function very well. But I mean, you know, we don't, we wouldn't know that the, that the range of the, this particular species is, is reducing dr drastically. So that's, it's the evidence base for, for global change. Yeah. But I think this, this topic of resiliency in the face of climate change is going to become more and more important um, moving forward. I mean, if I could think of a, of a dream data set, it would include herbaria, you know, herbarium specimens, the genetic data that you were talking about, but also a chemotaxonomy of these plants. I'd love to look like just have, you know, huge data sets of mass spec analyses on these yeah. just so we could better understand their, their secondary metabolite profiles, but also their, you know, other vitamin and nutrient contents and, and the possibilities that they might have for food. So you're describing what the, yeah. what the community, the community is all coming together to call the digital extended specimen, which is essentially oh. not a specimen, 
Mm-hmm. So it's a whole concept, which is being, I mean, GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, has been leading a kind of consultation amongst the community about about what do we call this? How do we how do we how do we manage the information? Because managing all that information it's a is lot a of challenge data. in and of itself. Mm-hmm. And so um, lots of lots of different um, people have contributed to this GBIF consultation, which is being done with with DISCO, which is a big European um, infrastructure project, and iDigBio, which is a big mm-hmm. US infrastructure project, and Atlas of Living Australia. You know, and the same the, the, those kinds of institutions or assemblages of institutions. Um, but I think it also means that we might think about collecting in a different way. So I collected, I would just kind of go through the forest and collect everything I saw in flower and fruit. And I had a quota from the from the garden and I was mm-hmm. supposed to collect X plants a month, right? And I think maybe we might need to think about collecting in a different way and spending more time collecting each plant. So more time actually doing each collection and taking ecological data, looking at the soil chemistry, looking at the, you know, collecting for the soil chemistry and really thinking about that specimen as not just one thing on a piece of paper, but an assemblage of information which then later becomes connected back and that one thing on the piece of the paper becomes kind of the, the core from which all the rest emanates. That's great. Yeah, so that we can really understand what the environmental factors are that influence that plant at that t- moment in time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, as we get closer to wrapping up, I was just wondering if you had any advice to offer to the audience if they'd like to learn more about this um, plant family, where they can go, or any resources you could recommend. Well, there's 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 a wonderful book which was published in the 1960s by my great colleague Charlie Heiser called Nightshades: The Paradoxical Plants. So I bet local libraries have that one. But we've also got a, a website which we've been putting together about the family, which is called Solanaceae Source, all one word, Solanaceae Source.org. Mm-hmm. And um, on that, we've been putting interactive keys to selenum, and we're starting to kind of put up descriptions of other plants and photographs of things. And and um, it's more of a, a sort of um, species description type website than a, than a specimen type mm-hmm. website, but then the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And then some of the stuff that's in my own museum, I've done lots and lots of events and things about, about Solanaceae, which, which are all online. So that's great. Solanaceae source has been a great, it's been a great joy to me to be, to, you know, to be able to say, yeah, we'll just put all those descriptions online and then they're all available and they're available to the people who need them because so often what we end up doing is publishing papers and they end up behind a paywall Mm -hmm. and the people, we, and, and you know, I can get at them, and you can probably get at them from the university. But the the farmer in Africa, or the scientist in in Southeast Asia, or the scientist in Brazil who needs access to that, there's no way. Yeah. So publishing 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 responsibly when it's about biodiversity is important as well. And thinking about how you, I mean, it's fine to publish stuff behind paywalls, but then if you can get the really essential bits out into the public domain, that that's really important as well. Well, that's great. It's a great ethos to ensure that this knowledge is shared, um, especially where it's needed most. Well, that's sharing great. is sharing is really important. I mean, sharing, you know, sharing means that you don't you never have to face anything alone if you share <laughs> stuff with people. It's always much more fun as well. It works faster, too. I find that taxonomy, doing taxonomy, doing doing the actual thinking, what's what what species is this? Is this mm-hmm. different? Than this actually is easier with several of you because you can bounce ideas off. Whereas when you're on your own, which is the way taxonomy has always been done, mm-hmm. is by one man in the corner with his microscope, <laughs> always man in the corner with a microscope, and you know, you just mull it over in your head and you don't, you never get anywhere because you always are doubting yourself. Whereas somebody else will have a diff- slightly different perspective and they'll go, "Well, have you thought about this?" And you think, "No," and suddenly the problem just goes away. That's great. <laughs> it's marvelous. Well, I have one last question for you. Um, as as an expert in this family, do you have any favorite recipes that you like to cook with, 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 with let's say, with selenum species that the general public can access, like our standard um, ingredients? Ooh, yes. Well, ratatouille is a big one. Oh, nice. Ratatouille is a really big one because that's got eggplants and tomatoes and mm-hmm. zucchini, which are not really solanaceae, but they're kind of like them. 
<laughs> and then I also, there's a wonderful recipe, which is in a vegetarian cookbook I had from when I was a graduate student called the Vegetarian Epicure, which mm. is, I call Solanaceae curry, because it's peppers, potatoes, and tomatoes in a curry. Lovely. And that sounds amazing. Curry. And, and we, as sometimes at these Solanaceae conferences, which we have every year, we have kind of the whole community comes together. Um, the genomics people and the biodiversity people mm -hmm. all come together. And some of them we've had banquets, which have been entirely Solanaceae, just completely wow. Solanaceae, <laughs> which is, I mean, there's other stuff in there as well, but the, yeah. kind of, the theme has been, how many things can you make with Solanaceae? And you know what? It turns out it's quite a lot. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Sandy, for coming on the show. It's been lovely speaking with you. Well, thank you very much for having me, Cassandra, and good luck with your herbarium. And I think digitize, digitize, digitize. Digitize, yes, absolutely. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious recorded on Skype during the COVID-19 isolation period. You can find this and all of our other episodes at our website at, uh, at foodiepharmacology.com. You can also go to our YouTube channel and look at uh, Teach Ethnobotany and check out the Foodie Pharmacology playlist. I want to give a big shout out to the show's producers to Christine Roth and Rob Cohen from Co-Conspiracy Entertainment. Thanks so much to you all the listeners for tuning in today. Stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time. <laughs>